Hello everyone, I hope you're having a great weekend so far. I just wanted to make sure to get this video up of the last few slides that we missed. So all the sections in chapter 2 were working on developing the idea of a distribution. So we had measures of the middle of it, like the mean and the median and the mode, and then we started measuring the spread of it. So in addition to that, this section measures the um, position of a distribution. So quartiles are divided into a certain number of equal parts. So specifically to four equal parts, quart meaning four. Um, the first quartile is the first quarter of the data. The second would be the half mark of the data, like the median. And the third quartile would make the third quarter of the data. And if you were to subtract the Q3, the third quartile, from the Q1, the first quartile, it gives you what we call the interquartile range. So what the interquartile range tells us is what the middle of the data do looks like. So it leaves out those outlier problems and it just gives us what the middle, how far apart they are. So using that information as well as the minimum and the maximum for the data, we call that the five number summary, you can create this box and whisker plot. So it's called box and whisker because you have this box in the middle and then the lines coming out from the first quartile to the minimum and the third quartile to the maximum and creating the whiskers. So that's just another way that we visually represent the data. It's used a lot just to sort of show things in one shot. It gives you a good idea of what the center looks like, how spread out it is, if there may be an outlier, that sort of thing. So here's an example with a box and whisker plot. So in this example, we have nuclear power plants and the top 15 nuclear power producing countries of the world. And it's the number of plants in these countries. And so we've got those 15 observations. And then after the observations, we want to find the Q2. And we do that by separating it in half. So first, we're going to need to insert the, um, or get the data in order. But conveniently, they've already done that somewhat for us. Okay, so once you list it in order, you would then find the median the way you normally do by counting towards the middle. And if you take a moment and pause this video to do that, order the data from smallest to largest points, then mark out till you find the middle, and that'll give you that 18. And then from that, you find the median of the bottom half. Now you don't include that 18 of the median that you already found. You just look at everything below the actual median and count to the middle there. And that will give you the first quartile of 10. And then repeat that with the upper part again, not including the median as one of your um, observations. So there should be seven and you count to the middle of those seven and you'll find 31. Okay. And so then you plot it with your lowest point to your Q1, your median, your Q3, and then your largest. And you can see that most of the power plants are down here in this low level, but we've got one up here that's very far away from the others. So it shows us this outlier, and that the most of the distribution is down here. So deciles and percentiles are other ways of looking at a similarity as the quartile. So a decile would divide it into 10 equal parts instead of 4, and a percentile would divide it into 100. So for example, over here we have this OGIV, and the OGIV represents the cumulative frequency for all SAT scores. And so if we wanted to know what test score represents the 62nd percentile and how to interpret it. So we look on this axis that has our, our percentiles, follow it over, and you can see that there's one right there that seems to have that number. When we follow it down, we see that it goes here to about 1,600. So that means that about 62% of the students had an SAT score of 1,600 or less. So when you take standardized tests, there's often a percentile at the end, and it tells you where you are in the range of everyone else. 
There's also z-scores to help us see how far away a specific value is from the mean. So in addition to finding how far it is from the mean, you need to divide by the standard deviation so that a distribution that's more spread out versus less spread out doesn't look like a value is closer to the mean or less or further. So these z-scores are going to become very important once we get to later chapters. So let's look at an example to make sure you know how to use this formula here. So for example, in 2009, Heath Ledger won the best uh, won the Oscar for the Best Supporting Actor at only the age of 29 for his role in The Dark Knight, and Penelope Cruz won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress at age 34 for her role as Vicky Cristota Barcelona. And so we know the distribution of actors and actresses aren't the same. Right here it even says the average um, age of a man winning that was 49.5, whereas a woman is 39.9. The distributions, meaning the standard deviations, are similar. It's only 13.8 years for men and 14.0 for women, but they still um, have that difference. So we need to look to be able to compare. We want to know, were either of these unusually young based on the distribution? So to do that, we're going to need our z-score formula. So it told us that Heath was age 29, but all actors are 49 with a deviation of 13.8. So to get his z-score, we take his value and subtract the mean for all actors, 49.5, and then divide by the um, standard deviation. And then for Penelope, for her z-score, we take her age, subtract out the age for the average actress, and then divide by that standard deviation. Again, I'm putting parentheses because you want to make sure you subtract before you divide. So, if you type that into a calculator, you will find that Heath Ledger was 1.49 standard deviations below the mean and Penelope Cruz was 0.42 standard deviations below the mean. Now both are between what we would consider to be a normal value of negative 2 and 2, so neither are extremely young for the distribution, but we can look at that and tell that Heath Ledger was further away from the average of his mean of the, ma of the male actors, as opposed to Penelope being fairly close to the mean of supporting actresses, even though their ages weren't that far off. That's because the distributions have different um, averages and standard deviations. So I hope you found this helpful to finish up Chapter 2. I'll see you all on Wednesday.